Welcome again, I'm Robert Breaker, and we're starting in chapter 8 today in our verse-by-verse -verse Bible study. So, get your Bible out and turn with me to John chapter 8. As we read through John chapter 8, and actually the whole book of John, we come to a conclusion that cannot be helped. And the conclusion that we come to is that the Pharisees did not know their Bible. There were people around here in the time of Jesus who were called Pharisees. And you know, that does not have a good connotation today. If you call someone a Pharisee, they're like, how dare you? Yet the Pharisees were the religious leaders of their day, kind of like a pastor of today. And as we get into this book, we're going to find out, it's right in their name. You think that they could see. <laughs> Can the Pharisees see? There's the word see. You think they'd know how to see. But the problem is, they were blind. They were blind. And the problem is, sin blinded them spiritually. And that's what we're going to get a hold of and look at and see as we go through John chapter 8. Now we're coming to a passage here in John chapter 8 that's one of my favorite passages in the Bible. I just find this so amazing because they think they're going to outwit Jesus. They think they're going to come to Jesus Christ and trick him or deceive him or go, ha, ah, you know, and yet it backfires on them so completely that it's just utterly hilarious. So let's start in uh, chapter 8 and verse 1. And I'm just going to read verse 1 through 11, then we're going to go back and look at this verse by verse. Now, some Bibles leave this out. Watch out for new versions of the Bible. Why would you leave this out? This is a great passage against adultery. And it's omitted by the Sinaiticus and Vaticanus, which are the Catholic Alexandrian corrupt critical text manuscripts. So, why would they leave this out? Could it be they were... I don't know, guilty themselves of this sin, spiritually and physically? See, this is the sin of adultery. And God is very much against adultery. In the Old Testament law, it's against adultery and fornication. We should not commit adultery. So I'm going to read verse 1 through 11, and we'll come back and comment on it. But I just want to get the story in your mind before we begin. But like I say, watch out for new versions of the Bible that leave things out. Jesus went unto the Mount of Olives, and early in the morning he came again unto the temple, and all the people came unto him, and he sat down and taught them. And the scribes and the Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they say unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Wow. So they caught her in the act of sexual relations with someone who was not her husband. Now Moses in the law commanded us, that such should be stoned. But what sayest thou? The law says this, Jesus. Now what do you say, huh? So that if he says something different, they can say, ah, oh, you're against the law. See what they're trying to do there? And then it continues there. This they said, tempting him, that they might have to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down, and with his finger wrote on the ground as though he had heard them not. So when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him cast the first stone. And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. And they which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last. And Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. In the midst of where? In the temple. <laughs> that would be like today, you find somebody committing adultery, and you grab that woman, and you take her to the local church while they're having service, and you take her down the aisle and say, I just caught this woman in an adultery! <laughs> That's basically like what it would be like today. But then it was in the temple. And then it says there, And when Jesus had lifted up himself and saw none but the woman, he said unto her, Woman, where are those thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? She said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Now verse 12 in my Bible has a paragraph mark, like it's starting a little bit different. And it's a different subject. But here we have what's called the woman taken in adultery. And these Pharisees, now was it Pharisees? What does it actually say? It says, and the scribes and Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. So the scribes were, were the priests. And so the scribes and Pharisees were the priest class. So get this, if you will, the priests. That's like a pastor coming. And the priests and the clergy bring this woman who's taken in adultery. 
Now, there's something that stands out here like a sore thumb. It takes two to commit adultery. Why did they just bring her? Where was the man? <laughs> and as I read through this passage, that's my first thought. Where was the man? Chapter 8, as we read through and we look at this, it makes me think that the men might have been those guys. And that maybe they were having a gangbang. And one of them goes, oh, let's go to Jesus see what he says about that woman being a wicked adulterer. Hey, that's a good idea, man. And they never thought that Jesus would say, and uh, who's the one that committed adultery with her? You ever think of that? That's kind of the way that a sinner thinks. He always thinks, oh, you're sinning, not me. People that are sinners don't want to admit that they're sinners. So where's the man that committed adultery? He's not there. But they were sinners. No doubt that these Pharisees were sinners. And my thought is, the more I read this, that I wondered if it wasn't the Pharisees themselves that were committing adultery with this woman. Let's go to John chapter 8, verse 21 real quick. John 8, 21. Then said Jesus again unto them, I go my way, and ye shall seek me, and shall die in your sins. Whether I go, ye cannot come. Look down at verse 24. I said therefore unto you that ye shall die in your sins. For if ye believe not that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. What was the sin? Well, in the context, it's the sin of adultery. There's also another sin, a sin of lying. And we're going to see some other sins here. Uh, there's some sins that these guys are guilty of. And the problem is, Jesus is telling them, you are sinners. And I've always wondered if they weren't the adulterers. And we get into this passage a little more in detail. I'll show you that. Because it looks like these Pharisees were literally demon-possessed. They were claiming to be of God, to be the clergy, the, the, the chosen priests of God, to be able to wait upon the temple and do the things of God, and yet they were serving the devil rather than God. And we see that in John 8, 44. You are of your father, the devil, Jesus says unto these people. Now, when Jesus showed up, the Bible tells us that he was the light that bringeth light into the world. So they were in darkness, and Jesus literally tells them, Hey, I'm the light. We stopped reading in verse 11, but look at verse 12. Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. So what they were in is they were in spiritual darkness. Now when Jesus showed up, Jesus shows up here. And Jesus shows up to Israel in this time, in a time of apostasy. Apostasy means a falling away from the truth. Israel was not keeping the law. They were engaging in sin and not trying to serve God. So Jesus shows up in a time of apostasy when he showed up. Well, Paul tells us in the last days there'll be a time of apostasy. So when Jesus comes again, it'll be in a time of apostasy in which many people are falling away. And you look at the local church today, you know what you find? You find a lot of people that claim to be pastors in many local churches who are adulterers, who've been married three or four times, who divorced their wives and said, well, I like that girl over there. She's more pretty, so I'm going to divorce this woman and go get that woman. That is sin, according to the Bible. God hates divorce. So Israel had a sin problem, and they were in darkness. They were in apostasy when the religious leaders were messed up. Over here, we have pastors. The Bible calls them elders. And over here, we see these pastors as well falling into sin. They are religious, but lost. And that's what's so sad about many people today that claim to be Christians. Even as these old Pharisees were lost, Today, there's a lot of people that are religious. There's a lot of churches all over the world. But they're full of lost people because the leaders are lost themselves. And that is sad. That is sad. So go back to John. Verse 1, let's start here. Jesus went into the Mount of Olives. Now, I don't write maps very well. I'm not a good map writer. But if you know Jerusalem, Jerusalem's over here in this area. And I, I'm not going to draw Jerusalem 
as a city. I just don't have time. But the city of Jerusalem sits here. And right about here was the temple. Now there's uh, some water that flows through here in this area. And this area is called the Kidron Valley. In the Kidron Valley, there's actually a spring down there, which is the Gihon Spring. So let me try to put this here. This is the Kidron Valley here. And round right about here would be the Gihon Spring. Now, right across from here is the Mount of Olives. I don't know if I'm going to miss it. No, that's good. This is the Mount of Olives. And we begin this chapter by Jesus on the Mount of Olives. That is amazing. Because when Jesus comes back at Armageddon, he comes back and steps foot on the Mount of Olives. I want to show you that. Go with me to Zechariah chapter 14. So Jesus is on the place that he's going to come back to in order to rule and reign as the king of Israel for a thousand years. So Jesus is coming back. And he's going to come back to this earth. Now, when he comes at the rapture, he's coming in the clouds. So he comes in the clouds at the rapture and calls up all of us believers. But then he comes down seven years later after the tribulation, and he comes down and steps foot on the Mount of Olives. Now, I've never been to Israel. I've never really wanted to go. And then a, a brother in Christ said, hey, I'd like to take you. And we had made plans, but then the whole COVID thing messed it all up, and I never got to go. So now I'm like, man, I, I wish I had gone. I, I would love to see all these places in person. But here's the Mount of Olives, and Jesus was sitting up here somewhere. And he's probably looking straight down at the temple the whole time he's up there. And so he's up there in the place that he's going to return to after the Battle of Armageddon. He's going to come down in Armageddon, destroy the Antichrist, and then come to the Mount of Olives. Now watch what it says in Zechariah chapter 14. Zechariah 14, verse 1. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, and thy spoil shall be divided in the midst of thee. For I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city shall be taken. Uh-oh. And the house is rifled, and the women ravished, and half of the city shall go forth into captivity. And the residue of the people shall not be cut off from the city. Now, when does this take place? When the tribulation. We know that the tribulation is seven years, according to Daniel and Revelation. And it's cut into three and a half and three and a half. And the book of Revelation tells us the last three and a half years, God protects Israel, but they have to flee. So this must be the battle that's taking place. And the Antichrist is coming in. And the Antichrist is taking over the city because he sits in the temple and says he's God. And the Jews flee. But before they flee, there's some bad things that's going to happen to those Jews. Verse 3, Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations, as when he fought in the day of battle. So then comes Armageddon, Jesus comes back. Now verse 4, And his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof toward the west. And there shall be a very great valley, and half of the mountain shall be moved toward the north, and half of it toward the south. And it goes on there. It's literally going to be cut in half, this mountain. Can you believe that? When he comes, he's going to make another valley that's going to go that way. So it's amazing that this is where Jesus will return after the battle of Armageddon and step foot on. And yet here he is in his earthly ministry on that very spot. Now Jesus is God manifest in the flesh. So what do you think Jesus was thinking as he's sitting up there on the Mount of Olives. He's sitting up there going, man, one day I'm going to come down and bust all these rocks apart. Man, one of these days I'm going to be right over there, and he's looking over at the temple, and I'll be sitting in there. I'll be sitting in the city of David. I'll be ruling over Israel. For... He's probably thinking of all these future things that the Bible says he's going to do. So this is where this starts out. He starts out with Jesus up in a high place looking down on the temple where all these bad, sinful, wicked people are. And Jesus has got to know, man, I'm going to win someday. And I'm coming back, I'm going to take this all over. Oh, and, and by the way, let me say this, Jesus didn't have a house. It sounds like everywhere Jesus went, he would rely upon the kindness of strangers to let him stay in their place and things like that. 
So Jesus went to the Mount of Olives, and early in the morning he came again unto the temple. So he's up here on the Mount of Olives, and then he comes down the mountain, walks down, goes across here, and comes in here, and there was an entrance in here. And they say that where the temple sat, you could stand up on the Mount of Olives and look straight down into the temple. And so Jesus is there, and he comes down, and he goes into the temple, which is what he does. He goes in there, and he teaches. He takes the scrolls and reads them, and usually would read passages about himself. And early in the morning he came again into the temple, and all the people came unto him. Notice it says he came again. So this is something Jesus does. So it sounds like uh, he's done this over time. Spends the night on top of a mountain, comes down, goes there, spends the night back. That's, that'd be fun, man. He's camping out. The original bushcrafter, Jesus Christ, you know, loves to camp. And in the morning he came again into the temple, and all the people came unto him, and he sat down and taught them. Okay? That's interesting because in a lot of churches, we stand at a pulpit. Well, he's sitting down and talking. There's nothing wrong with sitting down and talking. You do that a lot with Bible studies and things like that. And as he's sitting down and he's teaching them, and the scribes and Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. So when I look at this, I can just picture it in my mind, and that's what you're supposed to be doing as you're reading this. Jesus is sitting in the temple teaching, and all these people are sitting around listening. All of a sudden, hey! and there's this commotion, and it disturbs the service, if you will, and people look over, and here come these guys with this woman pulling her, and who knows if she's half-dressed, if she's got her clothes on, she's probably, you know, dressed, but just doesn't have it on right, and she's all like, oh, oh like this, and, and they're pulling her over, and they're interrupting his service. They're interrupting Jesus' uh, Bible study. And the scribes and the Pharisees brought unto him a woman. Well, who was this? The ones that were, should have been there listening. They're the religious leaders. They're the ones, the scribes that have the Bible. They're the ones that should have been handing the Bible to Jesus. And they, they should have been there listening, but no, they're out somewhere else with some woman. Hmm. And the scribes and the Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst... They say unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. So they bring an adulterous woman into the temple. What? I mean, if it's because you want her to get saved, yeah, bring her to church, because church nowadays is what we have. Now, I try to look at that back then and try to say, how would that be today? Well, today that'd be like bringing an adulterous woman to church. But why do you bring her to church? Well, my thought is I want to see her get saved and not do that anymore. Not them. We're going to read here in a second. They brought her because they wanted to kill her. Because the law says, kill those that commit adultery. So they didn't come to Jesus out of compassion and wanting to see her get saved. They came to him saying, we want to kill this woman. What do you say? Whew. There's anger, there's hatred, there's evil in their heart. Now, we look at this and we go, wow. Verse 4, she was taken in the very act. What did they do? How, how did they know that she was adulterating? Was she doing it out in the open? No, she was probably in a home. Maybe she was a prostitute. So did they go down to the local burdell or whorehouse and, and say, open that door, and then walk in and go, well, find one. There's one. Grab her. And, and while she's having, you know, relations with some. There's so many questions here. How did they know what she was doing and where she was? And how did they catch her in the very act? Were they lying in wait? My thought just keeps going back to maybe they were the ones that were sleeping with her. And then they thought, oh, let's go take her to Jesus and say, hey, the law says to kill her. But the law says not only her. We're going to get to that here in a minute. But they caught her in the very act. Now verse 5. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned, but what sayest thou? So the law, Leviticus 20, verse 10, and there's also something in Deuteronomy I'll get to here in a minute. But the law of Moses said you're supposed to stone someone who's taken in adultery. So let's go look at the law of Moses. Because they were quoting the law, but they weren't quoting the whole thing. <laughs> they were thinking, what a whore, she needs to die according to the law. They weren't thinking about the man. What about the man? What if they were the man? Hmm, you ever think of that? Leviticus chapter 20 and verse 10. And the man that committeth adultery with another man's wife, even he that committeth adultery with his neighbor's wife, the adulterer and the adulteress shall surely be put to death. So, not just the woman. 
They're bringing a woman. And they're like, that woman is an adulterer. The law says kill that woman. And uh, if they've known the law, the law says, no, you, you, you put to death the man too that's an adulterer. That's how stringent that Old Testament law was. Death penalty for adultery. You know, they don't do that nowadays. Some people might say good, but if there was the death penalty on adultery, do you know there'd be a whole lot less adultery? And I think that's why Jesus put it in the law, because he didn't want people to do that. So go back to uh, John chapter 8, verse 5. Now Moses and the law commanded us that such should be stoned, but what sayest thou? This they said, tempting him, that they might have to accuse him. So they wanted to accuse Jesus. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground as though he heard them not. Now, Jesus, he stoops down and he begins to write on the ground. Notice what he does. He's sitting there and he's teaching them. And then they're interrupted and this whore comes in. And there's all this commotion. I'm sure everyone's going, oh, oh. And then they're all looking at Jesus to see what he does. And Jesus doesn't stand up and go, well, here's what we're going to do. He just goes, he just starts writing on the ground. Don't you know they were angry? They're like, come on, we ask you a question. I mean, and he doesn't even give them the time of day. He just starts writing on the ground. What did he write on the ground? Well, there are several theories of this, of what Jesus wrote on the ground. One theory is Jesus wrote the Ten Commandments on the ground. And that's possible. He could have. He could have sit there and just wrote down the Ten Commandments in Hebrew on the ground. And I'm sure as he began to write, they all got curious. They go, what's he saying? They probably came around to look. And he could have written, thou shalt not do this, thou shalt not, and thou shalt not commit adultery. Certainly, that's one of them. And that's possible. Others, and this is what they call the traditional thought on it. This is what the church for many years believed. And I don't, I don't buy this one. Some people think that Jesus sat down and he wrote the name of every man and that he wrote the sins of every man. And so the men came around and looked, and, it, oh, that's me. How does he know who I am? Oh, that's, how do you know I did that? And so that's what, I don't, why would Jesus do that? Jesus always answers with Scripture. Remember when the devil came to Jesus? And Jesus says, it is written, it is written. So Jesus, I'm sure he was probably writing Scripture. So this is what my thought is. I think that Jesus sat down and wrote Deuteronomy 22 and verse 22 through 24. Or maybe he wrote Leviticus 20.10. But look at Deuteronomy 22. They're sitting there going, the law says, the law says, the law says. Well, wouldn't it be like Jesus? <laughs> wouldn't it be the right thing for him to sit down and actually write what the law says? So you're quoting the law, but you won't even tell me reference where it is. Let me, let me write down exactly what it says, and let's look at that together, Okay. What if he wrote Deuteronomy 22, 22 through 24, which says, If a man be found lying with a woman married to a husband, then they shall both of them die. <laughs> Jesus says, hey, man, if there's somebody taking an adultery, it takes two to tango, buddy. It's not just that woman was committing adultery. There was a man there, too. And the Bible says they both shall die. Well, where was the man? Well, some people try to make you think they came and they caught the girl and the man, oh, and he jumps out the window and runs off. Well, they probably would have known that man. It was a small community then. So why is there no mention of who the man was? Was the man one of their friends? And they didn't want to implicate their friend in a scandal, but they certainly wanted to bring that woman? Interesting. Deuteronomy 22, 22, If a man be found lying with a woman married to a husband, then they shall both of them die. Hmm. Both the man that lay with the woman and the woman, so shalt thou put away evil from Israel. If a damsel that is a virgin be betrothed into an husband, and a man find her in the city and lie with her, then ye shall bring them both out unto the gate of that city, and ye shall stone them with stones that they die. The damsel, because she cried not, being in the city, and the man, because he hath humbled his neighbor's wife. So thou shalt put away evil from among you. So Jesus literally says that evil is adultery. Adultery is evil. Remember what Jesus said about them? Oh, an evil and adulterous generation. 
So what did Jesus write? Well, this has been a controversy for many years. And a lot of people say, well, I think he wrote this. I think he wrote that. I'm just thinking, looking at Jesus' ministry, he always goes to Scripture. So my thought is, he sat down and he just drew out Scripture. He just wrote what the Bible says. And if he wrote Deuteronomy 22.22, it says both. And so without even talking to them, without even engaging them, without even going, oh yeah, well, where's the man? He just wrote that. And they looked at that and they went, we didn't think this through too well because we just brought the woman and not the man. Uh oh Well, who was the man? I wonder if it wasn't them themselves. I don't know. It doesn't say, but it makes you wonder if that's how depraved they were. They're sitting there sinning, committing a fornication and adultery and, and, and doing evil, and then, hey, let's take her to Jesus and see if we should stone her. Oh, okay, I'm next. Was that what was going on there? I mean, we're going to learn in the book of John just how evil these people were. So I wouldn't put it past them to have done something that wicked. John chapter 8. So Jesus stooped down with his finger and wrote on the ground. Verse 7, So when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. Doesn't that sound like Jesus is saying, Hey, now that I wrote what I wrote, if there's anybody here who's not an adulterer, go ahead and throw the first stone. I mean, that, that sounds like what the context is saying. Now verse 8, and again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. Twice Jesus writes on the ground. So my thought is, I wonder if he wrote one first, then spoke, then turned around. Because there's two passages in the Old Testament that say you're supposed to stone the man and the woman. And so I wonder, I just wonder, I'm connecting the dots here, if that's not what Jesus wrote on the ground was scripture from those two passages. It would make sense. Well, what happens? So twice he writes on the ground. Verse 9, And they which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last. And Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. So how many were there? Three? Seven? Ten? I, I don't know how many men. It doesn't say. I always thought there might be like seven or eight. But there have to be at least two. One to get her by either arm. And then the oldest and the youngest, probably there was two or three more coming with them. So let's, let's just say there was five or six guys there accusing this woman. Well, could those five or six guys have been in a whorehouse doing that with the woman? And then bringing, and that they themselves were guilty? Why did they get convicted by their own conscience and why did they walk away? Something was written on that ground that pricked their conscience and made them go, whoops, and made them do an about face and walk away. And the only thing I could possibly think would be that Jesus wrote the law that they claimed to follow. And the law says, you do the man and the woman at the same time. And then they got pricked by their conscience. So it almost sounds like, yeah, they were the adulterers. <laughs> and that's why they walked away, because they're like, drop the stone, walk away, boo -boo -boo -boo. Don't ask any more questions, because the next question will be, and who was the man that committed adultery? And they would have to say, it was me. And guess what? You're guilty of death under the law. So I read all that, and I look at that, and I go, wow, this is pretty amazing. Um, so Jesus writes a second time. What did he write the second time? Well, it could have been he wrote these. There's other verses, too, that he could have written down on the, on the dirt. I don't know. I wish we were given more details here, but sometimes it's, it's neat that it is so vague because it makes us wonder. Deuteronomy 5 and verse 18. Neither shalt thou commit adultery. Maybe, maybe he wrote that down. Deuteronomy 5 18. Maybe he wrote down Proverbs 6 3. No doubt, though, my thought is he's definitely writing Scripture because that's what Jesus did in his ministry. He quoted Scripture all the time. Proverbs chapter 6 and verse 32. Maybe he wrote this. But whoso committeth adultery with a woman lacketh understanding. He that doeth it destroyeth his own soul. Hmm. A wound and a dishonor shall he get. And his reproach shall not be wiped away. Hmm. Maybe he wrote that. Let's go to Hosea chapter 4. Maybe Jesus uh, went to the book of Hosea. Hosea chapter 4 and verse 12. My people ask counsel at their stocks. 
And their staff declareth unto them, For the spirit of whoredoms hath caused them to err, and they have gone a-whoring from under their God. They sacrifice upon the tops of the mountains, and burn incense upon the hills, under oaks and poplars and elms, because the shadow thereof is good. Therefore your daughters shall commit whoredom, and your spouses shall commit adultery. I will not punish your daughters when they should commit whoredom, nor your spouses when they commit adultery, for themselves are separated with whores, and they sacrifice with harlots. Therefore the people that doth not understand shall fall. There's a lot more there in that verse, but that's a prophecy of God saying, you know, you guys are so far to sin that you're a bunch of adulterers and a bunch of whores. And God says, but I won't punish you. And here we read in John chapter 8, Jesus deals with an adulterous woman, and he doesn't punish her. Is that fulfilling that scripture? <laughs> we'll see that here in a minute. Quite interesting, isn't it? Why? Because he came to bring grace. We may never know what Jesus wrote, because it doesn't tell us plainly, but my best guess was it was scripture, and I wonder if it wasn't those verses, or possibly others. At any rate, what Jesus did write pricked their conscience, and they dropped their stones. Hmm. They literally dropped their stones and walked away. The oldest first and then the youngest. I wonder why. I don't know. Maybe the youngers were looking up to the olders and learning from them. And the olders were so full of sin, they were saying, hey, we can get away with sin and things like that. But whatever happened, hmm. They walked away being pricked and convicted by their own conscience. Verse 9. Verse 10, when Jesus had lifted up himself and saw none but the woman, he said unto her, Woman, where are those thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? Now, it's funny that he, he, he lifted himself up and saw no one else. It would take a while to write that out in Hebrew. So maybe that's what he was doing, is writing that, those two verses that, in Hebrew, that's really long. Maybe when he's done writing that, then he goes, okay, and then they're gone because it took a long time to write it. And that's when they started going, doo, 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 exit stage right, <laughs> you know, and things like that. So we continue here at verse 10. Jesus said unto her, Woman, where are those thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? She said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Notice what she said. She called Jesus Lord. She looked at Jesus as the hope of Israel. Maybe that's why Jesus had grace on her, because he, he saw that she recognized who he was. But she said, no, Lord. What did Jesus tell her to do? And Jesus said unto her, neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. So quit your meanness. Stop sinning. Don't do this anymore. Now, verse 12, Jesus starts out by saying, I am the light. So we have a contrast, as we always do in the book of John, from darkness to light. From sin to the sinless one, Christ. And we see here, as we continue, Jesus starts talking about light. And the Pharisees are still there. So Jesus is dealing with these people. So this must be a little later, or maybe they came back. And Jesus begins to talk with the Pharisees. And it's obvious that they cannot see. Can a Pharisee see? Verse 13, the Pharisees therefore said unto him, Thou bearest record of thyself, thy record is not true. Okay, now I skipped verse 12. Let me go back and read verse 12. But the first thing the Pharisees do is they come and they say, You're a liar. And they say, Jesus, you're a liar. When they themselves are the ones that have been lying the whole time. Verse 12, then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Now you go back to John chapter 1. It tells us again that Jesus is the light. Verse 1, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Jesus is God. Verse 4, in him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. And um, he, it says in verse 9 that he is the true light, speaking of Jesus Christ. So, Jesus is the light in a day of darkness. He came in a time of apostasy, darkness, when sin was all over. And he came to try to show light. Where does light come from? The Scriptures. Amen. The entrance of thy word giveth light, the Bible says. The Pharisees therefore said unto him, Thou bearest record of thyself, thy record is not true. What did Jesus do? He didn't bear record of himself, he just wrote something in the ground. What did he write in the ground? I am God. 
I don't know what he wrote, but whatever he wrote, they came and they said, hey, you, uh, you're you not true. Now, maybe it's because he said, I'm the light of the world. They said, no, no, you're not the light of the world. That's a lie. But Jesus said he's the light. He is the light. Now, there's a lot of verses I wanted to get into about sin. And I, don't, hmm, I don't see there's enough time here. I'll just mention them. If you're writing this down, Romans 13, 12. Sin is darkness. Sin is black, Ephesians 5, 11. Black is the color of sin. Isaiah 64, 6 tells us that uh, all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. Well, a filthy rag has stains. Stains are black. Spot. Deuteronomy 32, 1-7. through 7. Ephesians 5, 27. 2 Peter 3, 14. Sin is like a stain on you. When I think of stains, I think of Bill Clinton and Monica Lewinsky and the blue dress. You know what I'm saying? That leaves a stain. Adultery is a sin. So certainly someone that is committing adultery is someone who is what? Who is in darkness. Who needs the light. So here in verse 13, they call Jesus a liar and untrue. But Jesus is the light. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 9. So why would they say, no, you're untrue. You're, you say you're the light. You're no light. What are you talking about? Why would they say that? Because Jesus is always thinking Scripture. That's about Him. And they don't know the Scripture. They're so ignorant and in darkness that they can't see what He's saying. Jesus is quoting Isaiah chapter 9. Look at verse 1 and 2. Nevertheless, the dimness shall not be such as was in her vexation, when at the first he lightly afflicted the land of Zebulun, and the land of Nephtali, and afterward did more grievously afflict her by the way of the sea beyond Jordan and Galilee of the nations. The people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. They that dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them hath the light shined. So Jesus is the light that is prophesied here in this passage. Now whenever I read this passage, I always think of Handel's Messiah. I love Handel's Messiah. Have seen a great light, have seen You know, it's this, oh man, Handel's Messiah gives me goosebumps so big a pig could suck on him. I'm telling you, I love Handel's Messiah, and he goes through all these Old Testament passages. But he's talking about Jesus being the light. Look at verse 6. For unto us a child is born, and unto us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Clearly that's Jesus Christ. So clearly in the context of this prophecy is Jesus Christ. In verse 7, of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Look down at verse 17. Therefore the Lord shall have no joy in their young men, neither shall have mercy on their fatherless and widows, for everyone is an hypocrite and an evildoer. <laughs> Jesus calls the Pharisees hypocrites over there in Matthew 23, I believe it is. What a hypocrite to bring a woman, says we found her committing adultery, when you were the one committing adultery with her, wouldn't you? Hmm. If that's what happened. And every mouth speaketh folly. For all this, his anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out still. So here's Jesus saying, I am the light. And the prophets of the Old Testament says, he's the light that shines in darkness. And they say, no, you're not true. You're lying to us. You're not that light. See, they're so into darkness, they can't recognize who Jesus really is. Verse 14, Jesus answered and said unto them, I'm in John chapter 8, Though I bear record of myself, yet my record is true. For I know whence I came, and whither I go. But ye cannot tell whence I come, and whither I go. So they call Jesus. Here's what they do. They are calling Jesus, number one, a liar. You're not that light. Now watch what they do. Jesus steps up there, and uh, what does he say? He responds, and he says, um, I know, even if you don't. Ignorance is no excuse. If you want to be stupid, you can help yourself. But I know the truth, and I know where I'm from. I'm from above. I'm from heaven. And they're like, you're what? But that's what he says. He says, I know whence I came and whither I go. So I know that I came down from heaven. I know who I am. Now, verse uh, 15. Ye judge after the flesh, I judge no man. 
Now, the context is after the flesh. Now, Jesus is going to judge every man. But right then, he's not judging in the flesh. Whenever Jesus judges, he judges righteously. And he judges in the spirit. So that's kind of a thing there. Don't, don't ever judge after the flesh like the Pharisees. If you're going to judge, judge in the spirit and judge with the scripture, the truth, the light, the Bible. Don't ever judge by your opinion. Okay? Now, look at verse... Uh, 16, and yet if I judge, my judgment is true, for I am not alone, but I am the Father that sent me. It is also written in your law that the testimony of two men is true. So that would be who? Jesus and the Father. And we know who Jesus is. He is one with the Father because Jesus is God and the Father is God. They're one in the Godhead. It's the Holy Spirit is God as well. And it continues there in verse 18. I am one that bear witness of myself, and the Father that sent me bears witness of me. Verse 19, Then said they unto him, Where is thy Father? Jesus answered, You neither know me nor my Father. If ye had known me, ye should have known my Father also. Now who is the Father? God the Father. These words spake Jesus in the treasury, as he taught in the temple, and no man laid hands on him, for his hour was not yet come. I find that so amazing. It says he was in the treasury. Why? Because Jesus is the true treasure. He is worth way more than money. But the Pharisees, all they wanted was money. They didn't want Jesus Christ. So how interesting. All these little details that John puts in there, that I really believe the Holy Spirit put in there, just to make you think that the true treasure is Jesus. And he's doing all this in the treasury. Do you have him as your Savior? So they're blind. They can't see who Jesus is. They don't see that he's the true treasure. And they're standing right there in the treasury. Verse 21, Then said Jesus again unto them, I go my way, and ye shall seek me, and shall die in your sins. Whither I go, ye cannot come. Then said the Jews, Will he kill himself? Because he saith, Whither I go, he cannot come. So they say, Jesus, you're a liar. And they're saying, What, are you suicidal? suicidal. Now that's kind of a tactic that many people use today that are communists. Oh no, is that guy suicidal? And then all of a sudden you find him dead one day and you go, oh man, he was suicidal. When the truth is they killed him and made it look like a suicide. <laughs> are they trying to set this thing up to where they can kill Jesus and go, well he was suicidal, so you know he committed suicide. No one killed him when they're the ones that want to kill him. Hmm, you got to wonder about that. Now verse 22, then said the Jews, will he kill himself? Hmm. 21 says, Then said Jesus again unto them, I go my way, and ye shall seek me, and shall die in your sins. Whether I go, ye cannot come. He's saying, I'm going to heaven. You're not going to heaven, because you're lost. Then said the Jews, Will he kill himself? Because he saith, Whether I go, ye cannot come. And he said unto them, Now here's what Jesus says, Ye are from beneath. I am from above. You are of this world. I am not of this world. Jesus says to them, You are from hell. Down below. Is Jesus addressing them, or is Jesus addressing the demon inside of them? The more you read this book, the more it makes me wonder if they weren't completely given over to Satan and demon-possessed. And when Jesus is talking to them, he's talking to the devil inside of them. and saying, hey, you know what, devil? You're from beneath. You're not from um, where I come from, heaven. You're of this world. So, verse 23... And he said unto them, You are from beneath, and I am from above. You are of this world, I am not of this world. I said therefore unto you that ye shall die in your sins, for if ye believe not that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. So here we have the who message again. Remember the who message? Believe in who Jesus is. Well, that whore believed in Jesus, who he was, because she said, Lord. But today the message is all about what Jesus did. And what did he do? He shed his blood. So today we trust the blood to be saved. We're not saved by simply believing that Jesus is the Messiah. But it is good to know who Jesus is. You should know he's God, manifest in the flesh, who came to die for us. That's a great thing to know. So we preach the message of what Jesus did. Here it's still the message of who he was. They didn't even believe that Jesus was who he said he was. God, the Lord, the Savior, the Messiah, the Christ. Now, verse 25. Then said they unto him, who art thou? And Jesus said to them, Even the same that I said unto you from the beginning. Who has he been saying that he was from the beginning? Sent from the Father. 
So they should have looked at that at the very least of, well, maybe he's just a prophet. But he's more than just a prophet. He's the prophet. He's the promised seed. He is the Messiah. He's the Christ. Continue reading there. And uh, verse 26, I have many things to say and to judge of you. Jesus is the judge. But he that sent me is true, and I speak to the world those things which I have heard of him. Who's he talking about? The Father. They understood not that he spake to them of the Father. Oh, there it is, verse 27. So they didn't understand. They're spiritually blind. They can't see. Then said Jesus unto them, When ye have lifted up the Son of Man, then shall ye know that I am he, and that I do nothing of myself, but as my Father hath taught me, I speak these things. What does he mean when I'm lifted up? Well, Christ lifted up on the cross. So when I go to the cross and I die on the cross, you're going to see. And what happened? There was an earthquake. There was darkness. Um, the temple rent and things like that. All pointing to who Jesus was. Even a lost centurion said, truly this man was the Son of God. So they're not seeing it now, but I find it amazing because in chapter 9 he does another miracle to show them who he is. And we'll get to that hopefully soon. So look at this in verse... Um, 29. And he that sent me is with me. The Father hath not left me alone, for I always do things that please him. As he spake these words, many believed on him. Well, thank God. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed. So you got to continue. See how that's not Paul's gospel? That's still here before Jesus died. And they needed to continue because they believed who he was. And if they continued in him, then they would have got the message of trusting in what he did. So there is a continue, but for us, once saved, always saved. But a lot of people like to go to this verse and say, it's not once saved and always saved. If you don't continue, you can lose it. See how they're taking it out of context? That's before the cross. So why are you doing that? Because they don't write the divide. And then Jesus says, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Now this I cannot drive home enough. Make you free is what our King James Bible says. New versions say set you free. They change it. Are new versions correct? You go to jail and they set you free. You can go do another crime and go back to jail. Now you need to be set free again. And then if you get set free, you can go do another crime and come back to jail. You get out by being set free. That is not what the Bible says. Through Christ, he makes you free. And once he makes you free, you're still free. You can't be brought back into bondage because he makes you free. So that's just one of those little words that when they change in new versions of the Bible, it can change doctrine. And I've heard people in new versions say, and Jesus can set you free. Now you can still sin and lose it. But come back to him so he'll set you free again. No. Once free, always free. Once saved, always saved. Remember that. I hate it when they change verses in the Bible. It does affect doctrine. So Jesus says, the truth shall make you free. They answered him, verse 31, We are Abraham's seed, and we're never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou, ye shall be made free? Here is the great lie. Some of the greatest liars that ever lived were those Pharisees. And here they are lying, saying, we're free. What are you talking about? When the Roman government was in control of the whole land. And they were subservient to the Roman uh, province and the Roman governors. They had been conquered by Rome. And they said, we've never been in bondage to any man. You liar. In Egypt for about 400 years, in Babylon for 70 years, here in Rome now, you're in bondage. They're in bondage right now as they're speaking. Why are they lying to Jesus Christ and saying, we're not in bondage? A bunch of liars. Lying devils, those Pharisees. And they're still around today, unfortunately. Verse 34, Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. Jesus said, okay, you want to you wanna accuse me of stuff? Let's get back to the fact that you're a sinner, okay? Oh, they don't like to be called sinners. Verse 35, And the servant abideth not in the house forever, but the son abideth forever. If the son therefore shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. Okay? Not set free, made free. Now verse 37, I know that ye are Abraham's seed, but ye seek to kill me, because my word hath no place in you. He says, you want to kill. They had 
murder in their heart. And Jesus saw that and said, you're all a bunch of murderous, adulterous Pharisees and hypocrites. And all you want to do is kill me because you're drunk on power and money and fame. And you're just evil as you can be. Now watch this. Jesus said, I know that you are Abraham's seed, but you seek to kill me because my word have no place in you. I speak that which I have seen with my father, and ye do that which ye have seen with your father. What is he saying? Your father is Satan. Jesus literally says, you're of the devil. You're not of God. That's what Jesus is saying to them. You're of the devil. You're not of God. Wow, what a thing to say. And uh, look there in verse... Um, Verse 39, they answered and said unto him, Abraham is our father. Jesus saith unto them, If you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. But now you seek to kill me, a man that hath told you the truth, which I have heard of God. This did not Abraham. Verse 41, ye do the deeds of your father. Now watch this. Then said they to him, We be not born of fornication. We have one father, even God. The Pharisees said, What are you doing? You bastard. They literally call Jesus a bastard. A bastard is someone that's born out of wedlock. And so they accuse Jesus of being a liar. They say, you're suicidal. They say, you're, you're a bastard. Why should we even listen to you? Why? What a shame. You were born without a, 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 a father. Or maybe your father, you know who he is, but your father and your mother committed adultery. They're calling Jesus a bastard, born out of wedlock. They don't stop. Um, was Mary impregnated by a man through an act of fornication? Not in your life. The Bible tells us clearly. Luke 1, 30-35. Read Luke chapter 1, verse 30-35. through 35. Mary clearly says, I do not know a man. Read Matthew chapter 1, verse 24 and 25. It says that Joseph knew her not until she brought her firstborn son. So Jesus was not a bastard, but they called Jesus Christ, God manifest in the flesh. They say, you bastard. What a horrible thing. No wonder they have such great condemnation. They're full of sin, and now they're mocking God incarnate on the earth, calling his parents fornicators. Jesus said to them, If God were your father, you would love me, for I proceeded forth and came from God. Neither came I of myself, but he sent me. Why do you not understand my speech, even because you cannot hear my word? Now, I had a whole bunch of verses here on that, but I'm um, running out of time. I guess we'll take time to see this because I want this is pretty important. Matthew 13, 14. Matthew 13, 14. And in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, which saith, By hearing ye shall hear and shall not understand, and seeing ye shall see and shall not perceive. For this people's heart is waxed gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes they have closed, lest at any time they should see with their eyes, hmm, and hear with their ears, and should understand with their heart, and should be converted, and I should heal them. Now, this is the chapter where uh, we see, you know, verse 1 on down, the sowing of the seed, and how once the truth is sowed, here comes the evil one to try to get it out. Another verse that kind of points to they're demonically possessed because they're not hearing what Jesus said, and the demon is like shutting their ears and keeping them from hearing what Jesus said. Now verse 44, Jesus goes on the offensive. And Jesus says, Ye are of your father the devil, and the lusts of your father you will do. Well, what is lust? Giving into fornication and adultery. So pointing at the fact that they are probably the ones guilty of the adultery. They were the missing man. The lust of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh the lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. And because I tell you the truth, you believe me not. Which of you convinceth me of sin? And if I say the truth, why do you not believe me? Jesus says, I haven't sinned. You're the sinner. So go ahead, tell me, what did I do wrong? He that is of God heareth God's word, ye therefore hear them not, because you are not of God. Now, it's very easy to just read through this quickly, but think of how Jesus is speaking to them. Is he just saying, He that is of God heareth God's words, you are not of God, blah, blah, blah. or is Jesus saying, Listen here, buddy. Listen here, you bunch of reprobate devils. Listen here, you sinners. You are of your father, the devil. 
and the lust of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth. And, and is Jesus speaking like that to him? The Bible says he spoke with authority. He was probably with his finger up in their face saying, you're of your father the devil. That's who you are. Whew. That's a side of Jesus people don't want to see. Now, verse 48. I want to finish this up today, so if we go a little long, we go a little long. Then answers the Jews and said unto him, Say we not well that thou art a Samaritan? Now they're coming to racist. That's a little bit of racism there. That thou art a Samaritan and hast a devil? They accuse Jesus of being demon-possessed. They're accusing him of all the things that they are guilty of because they're the adulterers and the fornicators. They're the liars. They're the ones that are spiritual bastards in the sense that they're not saved. They're the ones that are most likely demon-possessed. And now they say, Jesus, you got a demon. Verse 49, Jesus answered, I have not a devil, but I honor my Father, and you do dishonor me. And I seek not mine own glory. There is one that seeketh and judgeth. Verily, verily, I say unto you, if a man keep my saying, he shall never see death. Then said the Jews unto him, Now we know that thou hast a devil. Abraham is dead in the prophets, and thou saith, If a man keep my saying, he shall never taste death. Now what is Jesus talking about? Well, the kingdom could have come then, but we have two deaths in the Bible. We have you die physically, and then we have the spiritual death of when a person who's in hell comes out, they're resurrected, and then they're pitched into what we call the second death. So if you come to Jesus for salvation, then you don't come to the second death. Now, Verse 53, Art thou greater than our father Abraham, which is dead, and the prophets are dead? Who makest thou thyself? Well, the answer is, yes, Jesus is great, and he's way greater than Abraham, because Jesus is God manifest in the flesh. Verse 54, Jesus answered, If I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It is of my father that honoreth me, of whom you say that he is your God. I love how Jesus says that. You say that your God is the Father, Jehovah. He's not really your God. I know who your true God is because I can see your heart and I can see your sins. And you guys aren't even saved. Verse 55. Yet ye have not known him, but I know him. And if I should say I know him not, I would be a liar like unto you. But I know him and keep his saying. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. Now when did Abraham see that day? Well, by faith Abraham. So God must have revealed to Abraham some prophecy of the future of, of a coming king and messiah and things like that. There was something that Abraham saw, but he saw from afar off, and he saw kind of through a glass dark, but he didn't see it perfectly. But he saw by faith there would be a promise that would come. Now, verse 57, Then said the Jews unto him, Thou art not yet fifty years old, and thou hast seen Abraham? Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Before Abraham was, I am. And when Jesus said, I am, what did they do? They picked up stones to kill him. Look at that last verse. Then took they up stones to cast at him. But Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them, and so passed by. So they said, what? Why did they not try to kill him before that, for all the things he was saying? Why was it that they tried to kill him when they heard the term, I am? Because they finally saw something they didn't want to see. This is called the Tetragrammaton. Let's go to Exodus chapter 3. Every Jew would have known this. And in Exodus chapter 3, we have Moses. They call this, I am the Tetragrammaton. Just a big fancy word for how God refers to himself. And God refers to himself as I am. And in Exodus chapter 3, verse 13 and 14, we read these words. And Moses said unto God, Behold, when I am come unto the children of Israel, and shall say unto them, The God of your fathers hath sent me unto you. And they shall say to me, What is his name? What shall I say unto them? And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. That's in all capital letters in my Bible. And he said, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am hath sent me unto you. So God refers to himself as I am. And the reason is because he has always been. He wasn't at one time, and then now he is. He's eternal. So if you're eternal, that means you've always existed. So you never were created. 
So you've just always been. So you are. So he said, I am. And Moses said, how, how do I call you? Who, who do I tell Israel that you are? And he says, tell them that I am that I am. I am the I am. And so Jesus says to the Jews, you want to hear something? I am. And they looked at that and said, are you saying that you're the, the great God Jehovah, whose name is I am? And Jesus is like, I am. <laughs> That's who I am. I am the I am. They said, uh-oh, uh-oh. And what did they do? They accused him of blasphemy because they would not believe that Jesus was who he said he was. They didn't want to believe that Jesus was God. And yet he flat out told them, and they said, let's kill him because we don't believe he's God because the Old Testament law says if somebody blasphemes God, then you're to stone them. Well, if he wasn't God, then he was lying, and he was blaspheming, and he was worthy of death. But if he was God, then he's not worthy of death, right? Now look at verse 59 one more time. Then took they up stones to cast at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them, and so passed by. This sounds like some sort of a miracle. All these guys pick up stones. How many of them? How many? I think there has to be something like 70 for the Sanhedrin. So maybe 70 at least Pharisees, maybe more, maybe hundreds of Pharisees all standing around, all upset and all angry and all picking up stones, and they're going to kill Jesus. And the Bible says, and he just walks through the middle of them. I've always wondered how. Did, he, did they just like, oh, okay, and change their mind? Or were they all like, ah, and then they just froze. Ah, and they can't move, and they're all like, I can't move, me neither. Oh, what do we do? I don't know. I want to kill this guy. I can't do it. And he's like, oh, see it. He just starts walking through the middle of them. I don't know, I wasn't there, but however that happened, that had to be something interesting. Because Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple going through the midst of them and so passed by. So how did he hide himself going through the midst of them? Did he turn invisible all of a sudden? And they're like, throw stones at him! Where'd he go? And he's still there, but he's invisible. He's just walking right through them. I mean, it doesn't explain what took place here. But it probably was a miracle. Now watch what happens in chapter 9 and verse 1. And as Jesus passed by, he saw a man which was blind from his birth. He's telling the Pharisees, the problem is, you're all blind. And they can't see that they're spiritually blind. And they try to kill Jesus, because they won't believe that he's God. And he walks right out the door, and the first thing he does is he sees a blind man. He says, you know what I'm going to do? My next miracle is, <clears throat> everyone pay attention, my next miracle is I'm going to heal a blind person. To prove that I am who I said I am. And if I can heal a man who's blind physically, I can sure save a man who's blind spiritually. And that's what happens, and we'll look at that next time in John chapter 9. How Jesus heals a blind man. And as we go into that chapter, we'll find them being so angry. All they know how to do is just get plumb mad. The Pharisees get angry. And they're mad that Jesus would heal a blind guy. Because he did it on the Sabbath day. Such hypocrites. We keep the law, we keep the law on the Sabbath day. We can't do this, that, or the other thing. And yet the chapter starts out with making it look like they were the ones that were adulterers that should have been stoned to death according to the law. But they didn't want the law when it applied to them. They just wanted to use the law to harm someone else. Interesting. So... There you go, and may I say, as I close here, that the world hasn't changed much today. I look at politics in America and around the world, and you see two groups of people. And those Pharisees are still alive and well. And uh, a lot of them belong to a certain political party, <laughs> which loves to attack and put people down and lie about them and call them names and things like that. They get angry and, and fly off the huff and get upset easily you know you you look at this and you say man human nature hasn't changed much over the last 2,000 years oh that Jesus would return and take us out of this world because there are more Pharisees today than there have ever been and that's sad all right we'll see you next time John chapter 9 God bless bye bye